Okay, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. Uh, what can I say? I see a lot of familiar faces. I see people that I know. Uh, the, uh, the system tells me what countries you're connecting from, which is always very interesting. Uh, so I see people connecting from Ireland. So it's very good to know that uh, people are, are tuning in from home and almost none of you are related to me as well, which is very good. Uh, in fact, none of you are related. And I see some people from, from Spain as well, some former students of mine, uh, which suggests that my classes must be, mustn't have been too bad if you're prepared to give up your free time. So it's uh, great to be here. And uh, we have uh, really about 40 minutes uh, to kind of go through everything we're going to go uh, through today. So the first thing to, to say is that uh, I think this is a great initiative. The idea of scale up yourself I always say anything to do with scale up in IE, I always like to be involved in. So usually when I talk about scale ups, uh, I talk about, um, you know, I talk about companies growing rather than people. So this is a very interesting uh, use of the word scale up. It's a very interesting use of, um, you know, this thinking of a person growing. Uh, the only difficulty, of course, is that when I talk about scale up, I talk about exponentiality and people don't really grow exponentially, although maybe they do. That's a sort of a, a theory we'll get to. So uh, I think this is a great initiative from IE and a great initiative from South Summit. And there are a couple of things that you can always say. Uh, in fact, I, as a professor, most of my job now is, is almost career coaching. There's much, you know, a lot of the information that you find in the classroom is available from, uh, you know, public sources and books and things like that, that the real value you can add is how you can kind of understand the person and what they're looking to do with their career and then add on things that uh, perhaps they're looking for and make them in the right direction. And it's something that, uh, so the job of a professor has changed from like transmitting information to much more uh, a sort of sense of understanding each person as an individual. Uh, and that's a, that's a great responsibility, but it's also something I enjoy. So Taylor Swift, get you weren't expecting Taylor Swift. So uh, anyway, uh, having a daughter is two daughters that are 12 and 10. Taylor Swift is about the only thing we can ever agree uh, to listen on in the car. And I also like this video because it's one of only about six videos that have over a billion plays on YouTube. But uh, those will recognize the song, You Belong to Me. Uh, and it's a theme that uh, I talk a lot about in, in my classes. Uh, which is this idea that a lot of the time people are very interested in connecting with people who are not interested in connecting with them. And curiously, there's all these other people who really want to meet them and really want to connect with them and they're not interested in doing it. So this is where the whole tailor comes. So it's like, you know, you have everything you want, but somehow you're always interested uh, in the other person. And in my case, uh, what I want to try and do is connect more people with scale up companies. So, you know, everyone talks about startups and everyone talks talks about scale-ups. And I, I understand why, because, you know, if you look at the five largest companies, if you look at, um, you know, back in the banks and the energy companies, they were the biggest one. And then in come all of the, uh, you know, the big five, like these technology companies. I mean, you know, Facebook is worth, uh, you know, 750 uh, billion now. You know, it's, it's edging up to be a trillion already. Apple are over it, uh, as indeed are, are Amazon and going gangbusters. So suddenly everyone uh, in the class wants to work for these companies. And the thing I say is that going straight into a company like Amazon or going straight into Google, and we have people every year who do this, uh, sometimes you're, you're not ready. Uh, and what I mean by that is that it's great to kind of get a job offer from Amazon, but Amazon are not a company that have, like, they expect you to be productive very quickly. Uh, so I have just as many as I have good news stories where people went in and it worked out very well. I also have bad news stories where they weren't able to deal with just the intensity of a company like Amazon brings. So I often say that, you know, don't, you know, it's good to dream and all of that, but, you know, don't, you have to sort of, think about the right time to join a company like Amazon and the right company to, to join a company like them. Uh, Scott Galloway, who interestingly enough thought in, in IE, uh, which is something, I guess, before he became really famous. I mean, now he's become uh, really famous. But before he became really famous, uh, he spent a semester here, which I always think is cool. Uh, and he spoke last week at the, at the, the Enlight conference, which is, which is also good. But he has this phrase, and it's market dynamics trumps individual performance. Uh, and if you think about it, it's actually, you know, Scott, you know, produces a lot of content, but it's one of those things that it's kind of being in the right place at the right time is often more important than being good 
uh, you know, the, a lot of kind of, you know, of the best footballers have never won anything, and a lot of the worst footballers just happen to be on the right team. So in that sense, uh, that, was, that was pretty good. So one of the things that you want to do is you want to get on the right wave. You want to connect uh, with your market dynamics, because sometimes just being in the right place at the right time is more important than, 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 than being good. So that's sort of what he means by this phrase. Uh, and this is, um, you know, there are a lot of career lessons around the place, but this is, you know, essentially um, agreeing with the same kind of point. Uh, and by the way, you can ask questions if you want. Those of you, I, I, when you type something into the uh, box, uh, I can see it. So generally, I take questions mostly about three quarters of the way through uh, if we have a few minutes at the end to answer them. But you're certainly welcome to, to make any comments uh, along the way. So the point that, again, he, the point he's making here is that you have to catch a trend early. So we can discuss whether Amazon would have been better, obviously, to catch it in an earlier part of its existing, because Amazon has kind of come, become like a corporation now, as has Google. A lot of people will say that there's no innovation in Google anymore. It's, it's all now execution. So I wonder sometimes, are these the best companies to join? And actually, I think that you're better off getting like the next Amazons and the next Google and the next of these kinds of companies rather than kind of jumping straight in there. And it's really important to catch a trend. I mean, the secret of Silicon Valley uh, is, is and, and maybe you could even say the secret of Wall Street, uh, is that it's a place for mediocre or unremarkable people, as Scott says, that those are places where unremarkable people uh, can become rich. And I you know, lived in Silicon Valley, and I know a lot of Silicon Valley people. And while you do meet a lot of geniuses, you meet a lot of people who, who were able to fit into a system and do very well in terms of stock options and things like that, even though they, they, were, they were really no genius. So this is kind of, you know, in terms of scaling up yourself, this is the question I'm addressing today, which is like, you know, what is the next trend? Not the trend that's kind of ripe now, but how do you get on to the next wave when it's easier to get on it so that you're ready uh, to catch, you know, the next wave of trillion dollar companies? And one of the big dangers, and there are MBAs, you know, both MBA graduates, recent and past on this, I see their faces and I recognize their names, and MBAs are terrible for the herd mentality. You know, they are terrible for all chasing the same thing. And when I was an MBA student, uh, I perhaps had some of it as well. Well, um, but one of the things, so like when all of MBAs are going into, are joining the FANG, everyone's joining the FANG. When they're all doing startups, they're all doing startups. When they're doing investment banking or consulting or whatever, they all seem to do the same thing. And, and there are, there's some very kind of damning research done on, you know, that, that when MBAs are applying to companies, that that suggests that the trend is sort of in decline rather than uh, in the rise. Uh, but the thing that is off, the point is often not made about MBAs is that while MBAs might be great at founding companies, if you look at every company that scales, there is MBAs in there. So while, you know, it's often criticized, entrepreneurship professors like me are often criticized and told you know that uh, oh you're you can't teach entrepreneurship and that kind of thing and sure that's true uh, in a sense that every entrepreneur has to have something like a chip on their shoulder or something they need to prove or or something like that what is also true uh, is that if you look at companies as they scale uh, an awful lot of them have MBAs in there working for them. While, so while business schools perhaps mightn't be very good at, at turning, at creating entrepreneurs perhaps from nothing, we've proven ourselves time and time again at giving the skills uh, that allow you to scale. So here's the question then which I have for you, which is to say if you don't want to join a corporation, if you don't want to join a corporation uh, which has, you know, long decision-making cycles and, you know, very structured kind of a mentality, but at the same time you don't want to join a startup, you know, what do you do? So this is kind of the hidden secret that I always talk about, which is this class of company. It's an innovative company which combines the growth opportunity of a startup with the structure of a corporation, and this is called the scale-up. So this is my overall message to you is quite simple, which is to say that, uh, you know, while you, a lot of certainly the people who take my classes and the people I meet are interested uh, in joining like the, you know, the FANG companies and the companies that are already scaled in billion dollar companies, uh, you know, 
but they're not interested in joining the companies that have got past the startup stage and are about to, you know. And the re one of the reasons for that is perhaps that they, it, they're hard companies to get into. In other words, they don't have processes, you know, they don't open requisitions, they don't have kind of formal, you know, and, and you know, I, for understandable reasons, nobody wants to chase something if they know there isn't a job. So what a lot of companies are really interested uh, is in is this notion of how do I find these companies and then how do I get in there? Uh, and I, what I always say to them is that, uh, first of all, you have to find the company, and I'll talk a bit more about how to get into those companies in a while. So. Familiar structure, just going to a bit about my background, then I'm going to talk about the scale-ups, then how you can find these companies, and then finally methods to go job searching for those of you that are in job searching. Okay? So if anyone wants to write, oh good, this is really interesting, professor, in the chat, by all means go ahead and, and do that. So uh, what do I do? So I teach all the scale-up programs here in IE, so I teach executive education, I teach the MBA, I teach the MIM, uh, I teach, um, you know, literally anything to do with scale-up, and uh, those are the companies I teach. Uh, this is my main program, which is the owner scale-up program, which is the company, we were one of the very first companies, uh, business schools, to ever talk about scale-up when we started talking about seven years ago, and now other business schools are putting on programs. But there, you know, I would argue that, that our, our program is, is very much based on exponentiality rather than on linear growth, uh, which makes it, makes it uh, you know, a rather interesting and different program. And uh, my own background, I've uh, set up six companies in total. Uh, this was one in the dot-com. We, we uh, six of us together, started former consultants, and we raised 75 million in scale to 250 people. Uh, this is another one more recently in Spain. Uh, we set up Hot Hotels. We were the first company from Spain to be accelerated by Techstars in the USA. This is me in the back row uh, with, you know, perhaps, uh, to be older than everyone else in the front row. But anyway, so that was another company. And then I spend, or at least I used to spend, uh, about 20 weeks of the year traveling, going around to conferences, speaking in various places, uh, you know, Colombia, Malta, Turkey. And, and I always found that governments are all particularly interested in this notion of scale up because they believe that, um, you know, that more startups would lead to more scale ups. And what governments don't need, governments don't need startups per se. You know, they don't need startups unless they can become big because it's only when they start to scale that they bring uh, things like um, you know employment and prosperity and those kind of things so actually some you can have too much scale ups which is or sorry too much too many startups at least I should say uh, which is a sort of a you know I could this is another talk would be on economic policy but the point is that I often uh, start don't even like use the word uh, startup I prefer to use the word pre scale up you know, which is that you're born to scale, and that this, the startup stage is really only things that you do before you start to scale. Uh, and that's very much my attitude that what startups should be, that startups should be uh, organizations that are looking to scale. And if you're not, you're just a small business, and that's fine, and there's room in the word for small business. But I prefer to think of startups, not as startups, um, but as, um, as pre-scale. So, um, you know, I also go on TV a lot and, and that kind of thing, which is always sort of interesting to do. Um, so let's talk a bit about scale-ups. So the first thing then uh, is, ooh, someone said a comment, brilliant. So the first thing is just to get the definition out of the way. And the truth is that the definition is, this comes from the UK government, and this idea of growing by more than 20% over a three year period. Uh, we don't have to get kind of religious about the definition of whether something is a scale up, but certainly whether something is undergoing rapid growth uh, is what makes it interesting. Uh, and that's uh, once something starts to grow, under, grow growth, then it's a scale up. It's not a start, it's kind of a, a struggling startup anymore. Uh, this very good looking gentleman here has some really interesting things to say about the difference between, uh, that's me by the way, okay. Uh, anyway, um, maybe less hair and stuff, but anyway, uh, that's for another moment. People in marketing do these lovely things for me. But anyway, interesting point is the definition between the two, the definition between startups and scale-ups. Uh, and what you find, I mean, I don't have time really to go into all the difference of them, but generally what you have is pre-product market fit and post-product market fit. In other words, what you're trying to do is you have an experimental stage when all you're doing is experimenting for a repeatable and scalable business model. And then you hit product market fit, and then you start to scale. Uh, the key for me in scaling has always been to 
to come up with an exponential factor. And I'll talk about why that's so important uh, now. Here's uh, Paul Graham's diagram, which kind of makes people understand it. And this is perhaps why we spend so much time on the start phase of the company and not enough on the scale uh, because you know the the startup phase of any company is is so eventful i mean you go through ups and downs and stuff like that whereas the scale uh, perhaps is uh, much more eventful but it's it's much different you know because you're starting from zero in the startup phase uh, you can very much um sort of you know compare someone else beginning at zero from you versus being with zero but all scale ups are different and and it's really hard and that's why i say that it's really hard to teach scale up it has it's more one-to-one -one mentoring uh, all of the people i work with to try and help them scale it's all on a one-to-one -one individual basis because we need to sort of like to get things done uh, you know, you know, to hire a key person or to raise money, it, it's something that takes a long time. And it's something that like small pieces of advice don't really help you. You have to kind of, you have to sort of set up a plan. It's more like invading a country or not that I've ever invaded a country, but when I read books about what it's like to invade countries, uh, there's supposed to be usually a plan. And that's why the biggest thing about scaling uh, is that it's about mentoring and one-to-one -one. and companies, uh, you know, Silicon Valley has done very well. I mean, because it has money, but also because it has a mentor and when I see countries that are starting to do very well with scale-up uh, companies, uh, one of the things I see is the big use of mentors. And that's always my advice to people, which is to say, how do you get mentors to bring people through the journey? Uh, that's always the key to, to more scale-up uh, companies. So, of course, we're all experts in exponentiality now. Perhaps we weren't uh, before the COVID thing happened, but this was basically me uh, talking about exponentiality for years and how powerful it was and how interesting it was, but nobody was really paying any attention attention to it uh, and you know there were rather like the people in the front of the class saying like why is he why does this guy get so excited about exponentiality I don't understand it at all but maybe now with COVID one of the small good things about it is that we're starting to understand this idea of how something can go from being very small to very big very quickly so the mathematical relationship um, is a bit like this now the maths here are sort of you know I always have some maths graduate in my class who, who talks to me about like this, or, this isn't really an equation but it's a it's a way of demonstrating how something can be small 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 and then quick and then big and that's the thing that you you know exponentiality is about it's about something that can be small for a long time and then suddenly the exponential effect kicks in and suddenly you have something that that's really big and that's why it's really powerful and that's why it's really interesting and and you know that's why the class this morning I was giving with the MIM I was saying really what you're trying to do after product market fit is add the exponentiality because of course you can scale uh, because you know um, things that were done uh, with more human factors or more non-process related stuff pre-product market fit you have to use an exponential technology whether it's robotics or AI or whatever it is in order to kind of grow in a way that the company doesn't see uh, that you're struggling so these are the exponential technologies. Uh, they're not all of them. This is something that I got from PricewaterhouseCoopers. And, uh, but it does talk about, although you know, I always think of drones are just flying robots, so they probably don't need a category on their own. But you can see these general things, AR, VR, uh, AI, of course. You know. And it's funny, no matter what kind of business you have, whether it's food delivery, you know, there's a space for an exponential technology. Uh, people sort of laugh at me when they say that, but it's like a lot of technologies. Some Something is invented everyone says this is going to be the future and then it doesn't become the future and then suddenly quietly it does so you know I can see exponential technologies uh, being a part of almost every company uh, that grows so then uh, our friends in CB Insights CB by the way stands for chubby bear which is a interesting thing so where do you find these companies and I think like the way to understand what's happening in the world, uh, I find these guys brilliant. I remember someone wrote me a student evaluation once after there. He talked about very interesting technologies, but he never told us where we could find these technologies. So at the time, CB Insights didn't exist. Uh, but since it's been there, I probably spend uh, more time on, on CB Insights than any other site. This is the website. This is sort of where you'll find it. And it's a sort of a place that if you're interested in technology and where the world is going, it's probably the best place you go and they are famous for these diagrams uh, this is the AI 100 diagram and it talks about the companies that are basically doing cool stuff in all of these areas 
So, you know, what's the best way to find out the next trend, you know, the next Google, uh, the next Amazon, the next Apple? Uh, I mean, actually, one of the ways uh, there was Apple just bought a company from Barcelona recently. So one of the ways you can get into Apple, by the way, is to work for a company that gets acquired by Apple or gets acquired by Amazon or gets acquired by Google, which is a way life can be funny one time. So I know the famous story of the WhatsApp founders who sort of, you know, were turned down by to go work. I think it was in Facebook, and then Facebook eventually acquired them. But anyway, that's um, that's an interesting story. Although actually, I think about it now, I think it was uh, Yahoo and Twitter that turned them down. But anyway, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So uh, yes, I really did say that. Anyway, so where are we now? So what we're doing is we're looking very much at. Uh, you know, the future and how we can identify companies that are doing cool stuff that one day will become uh, exponential companies. Uh, and the thing is, like, you, these companies probably, you don't hear about them in the general kind of, very often they're doing things very quietly. They're growing so quickly, they don't have the time to kind of do any marketing. Um, you know, you, they go to conferences, but they're hard to find. So, you know, my advice always is to sort of go to CB Insights. And uh, what you need to do then is find one of these CB Insights diagrams, look at things that you think you might be interested in, whether it's transportation or digital health or financial services or insurance or any one of these companies. And then you start to kind of, they're the names of the companies. And CB Insights are very good at identifying who the cool people are. Uh, and then you start to look them up. And then you, you use LinkedIn, or you find some way to find someone. And I always say, connect with the product people. Don't connect with the HR people. HR people are like the final stage of any process, you know, to check whether you have a work permit, or you know, to negotiate your salary, or something like that. But you know, this idea of connecting with the product people, and you know, like, I love your product, I love what you're doing. Why don't you launch in Spain? Why don't you launch in Morocco? Why don't you have a, you know, an Android version? You know, why don't you, why don't we use your product to do this? Like, all founders of companies are interested in talking about their company. It's not for no reason that they're called, like, this is my baby, this is my baby. Uh, this, you know, so they, that's what they're interested in talking about. Uh, and, you know, it's amazing. Uh, when I was sort of start taking my first steps, into uh, starting companies. There was no LinkedIn, there was really no internet. You know, finding the names of these persons, you had to kind of ring people up and try and socially engineer information from the person on reception. Whereas now you can find head of marketing for like, you know, Netflix Madrid or something, although I, that's a former student of mine. But the interesting point is that you, you know, this is the way you can do things. You know, you can find out the name of the company and there's always a way kind to get in there. So there's loads of these, like in all of the things we mentioned when we were preparing for this class all of the different areas. So that was the AI. I mean, AI encompasses everything. Google calls themselves an AI first company. So there's like AI in, in everything. But more niche areas perhaps are AR and VR, where again, you see what they're happening. There's stuff happening in education. There's stuff happening in digital health. There's stuff happening uh, in you know, all sorts of entertainment, for instance. So you know, here's the idea. If you're interested uh, in AR or VR, if you think that's something that you could jump out of bed in the morning and get interested in talking about how wearing goggles uh, can, you know, can, can do something better, then you know, what you need to do is go to CB Insights, get the name of the company, and then find a way to try and connect with the product people and, and you know, make something really cool as a, as a suggestion. Uh, this is you know, the automation, and particularly the automotive industry are, are really interested because many of them are transitioning from, uh, you know, I guess, gasoline type engines or, or, you know, combustible, whatever they call them, I don't know the word. Uh, it's this onto electrical stuff. So, you know, there, there's like nobody really has any experience in electric cars. It's still a, quite a new thing. So, you know, the game is very much open and in many ways they're like a flying computer. They have all sorts of technology in there. So again, uh, all of these companies are all interested and the ta these are the interesting companies to join. They won't be advertising their jobs or they'll be hard to find or something like that. But any company that's growing is hiring people. Uh, they just, you just have to put the pieces together for them. Uh, they don't really have time to kind of not put the pieces together. They don't have time to work out exactly. And sometimes actually they're quite open to hiring you in like two or three people together. You know, they particularly like the idea that like there was four of us and we studied together and we'd like to stay working together. And you know, even that thing is possible. So, you know, companies like if you can show that, you know, 
that, that you're sort of low maintenance, that you can kind of come in here and, and, you know, and just kind of work things out during all the chaos of a fast growing company. That's what they want. But they want people who can manage themselves. They definitely don't want people who are just there to take orders. And that's a mistake people often make in an interview. Here's Bitcoin and blockchain, you know, something very similar. Uh, you know, every bank that says they're not working and looking at Bitcoin and blockchain is probably lying. I saw Ant yesterday, I saw Jack Ma talking you know about the future of of digital currencies and stuff like that so again uh, you know this is very much in an interesting space and something to get involved in uh, and probably in terms of, of these are much easier than other people because it's easy to find out the players so you know digital health is obviously completely fascinating uh, you know all sorts of issues to do with data privacy and all sorts of issues to do with many many other things um, but I mean I don't think there's any doubt when I go now to the doctor to um, you know, get a checkup for like skin, you know, the pimples on my skin or something like that. Uh, Irish white skin on, um, you know, on a Spanish summer isn't really the best. So, you know, I've got to get my pimples. All they do is put a computer on my skin uh, and that's really all they do. So like there's no, you know, digital health stores that uh, and, you know, can maybe even do some sort of AI to work out between the delta between the previous time and the first time and do probability stuff and things like that. So, you know, everything from wearables, maybe the first versions of wearables weren't so good, uh, but the next versions are better. So, you know, digital health goes through this, you know, kind of peak of inflated expectations where it's like it's going to be the next thing and then it disappoints people and then it gets better and you see like the blood glucose stuff that's coming out now just as well as the heart monitor stuff that's coming out I mean you can't but think that kind of information uh, is, is not useful and again with COVID, COVID is proving to be an accelerant uh, and what you're going to have uh, is that um, what you're going to have is, is that you know people that were kind of uh, hesitant about various giving people information before now realize that hold on a second I don't want long long COVID I don't want morbidity so I want to try and lose weight so I need to find out like what it is I'm eating that's giving me all of these issues so you know expect an explosion uh, in, in digital health uh, you know these more healthcare unicorns uh, Scott Galloway always talks about this notion that you know Apple and the technologists are coming after healthcare and education because they're the biggest chunk of the economy that so far hasn't really been disrupted, that other areas have been disrupted, but you know, the billions and trillions that go into healthcare and education every year, that's an opportunity for them to get into. So I expect digital to penetrate both health and expect uh, digital also to, to, to penetrate uh, education. So again, you know, if you want to scale up yourself, if you want to try and get into an interesting uh, you know, company, what you do, you find out what you're interested in, you go to CB Insights, you find out the names of the companies, and then you try and find a reason why they should hire you. Um, you know, more and more, I mean, really, my, my classes aren't all like just showing slides from CB Insights, but just want to accentuate the point that, um, you know, like the fintech, like there's this perception, you know, that like, there's, oh, jobs, there's no jobs out there, whatever. There's loads and loads of jobs out there. You just, you know, the companies aren't ones you come across if you don't look for them. Uh, and then when you find them, they're not necessarily hiring. You have to put the pieces for them. But, you know, there's 250 companies in fintech, all of whom are doing interesting things, and all of whom, if they're growing, are, are looking at hiring people. So, you know, that's the way you, you find out and you connect with them. And then sometimes they do all your homework for you, and here's, like, the 50 future unicorns. So my... My advice, for what it's worth, is this notion that you find, try and join the future unicorns. Try not to join the current unicorns. Try and join, like, the future unicorns. Because worst case, even if that company doesn't work out very well, that what you will learn there will make you very valuable to another company. So when a company fails, very often it's because of bad management, but not because, you know, the, in other words, they couldn't perhaps get the business model exactly right. But the underlying thing they were doing very often was extremely useful and was directionally right. Uh, but perhaps, you know, they couldn't kind of get the, get the pieces together. So all of that information will be useful to another company. And more and more of the large companies are thinking, like, let innovation we buy from outside and distribution we do ourselves. Uh, so which is why, and, you know, and a company like Apple doesn't publicize all of the companies it buys for that reason. Similarly with Google, similarly with all of these people, they're all buying lots of small companies. Uh, so, you know, it's a very interesting kind of a thing to, to do. So we've uh, got about 10 minutes left, so we just want to kind of cover the last two issues. 
maybe I'll cover this in five, and then I'll have time for questions. I see Alexis has asked a question, and also Donald has, has asked a question. So we'll get to that uh, in a second, OK? So uh, the scalers. So this is the European scalers. So these are the people, you know, some of these companies you will recognize, you know, Izettle and Klarna, Blah Blah Car, and these kind of companies. And these companies are, you know, interesting companies. Generally, they're, uh, you know, uh, perhaps more available. Some of these do actually have HR departments and published specs and things like that. Uh, and they do combine those two things I was talking about. A company like OnTruck, for instance, has, you know, is a large company, well-funded, but has very much a startup feel, you know, the free Coca-Cola and stuff like that, you know, and, and just a kind of flexible working. And, and it doesn't have that kind of corporation feel, let's say, working, uh, you know, in, in a, anything, any company in the Ibex 25 has, where it's like people wearing suits and you know just meetings and emails and sometimes you feel what did I ever actually do so these kind of companies are all companies you can get uh, but there's also other places you can go and uh, I'm totally giving away and they're, they're gonna put this on YouTube but I'm totally giving away like my my best secret here but uh, you know if you do one good thing a day and uh, maybe you'll get rewarded for it in, in this life or the next uh, but like this is literally the best place to go and get jobs uh, and this is like the, the FT 1000 and like all of these companies a lot of them do very obscure things you know they do like plastic piping and you know all of these useful things that are necessary and that people buy and but but you know they don't and they, they really value business school education. You know, they very often they, they think, wow, like that's amazing. And they don't have CVs coming to them from people with business school backgrounds, uh, unless perhaps maybe the children of the founder or in some cases maybe the founder themselves. But in general, you know, they really value and, and rate. And a lot of people, you know, if you are, um, a lot of people say that they didn't get the value of their education but uh, by, you know, immediately, and I say, well, you did, you, you know, uh, in the sense of, you know, education is extremely valuable for making you more confident, is extremely valuable for, you know, just the ability to turn around and argue something uh, extremely, extremely quickly. So this is sort of my, my secret about, like, if, you know, don't go to the job searching places, go to these companies, get the names of the company and find a way to get in there. Uh, the CV is dead, obviously. Uh, you know, it's like the, I, people send me CVs and I'm like, I didn't even open it. it it's just an, it's a historical document. It's as interesting to me as your birth certificate. Like, send me your birth certificate if you want, because like, I'm about as interested uh, in the names of your parents as, you know, things that happened 10 years ago. What you need to do is build a trail. What you need to do is have a digital trail, which is like, that shows that you have an opinion and that you're self-managed. Uh, and this is, you know, of course, it's quite difficult to do this, but, you know, do you want a job and, and do you have the value or not? Uh, so that means blogging, that means tweeting, that means all of these things. Uh, and it's amazing how this works. I mean, I, I remember um, a former student of mine and I just said to her, just start blogging. Uh, and it turned out that, you know, she, she, I even asked her to publish some of the, the really good papers she had written for my class. And then, like, that was a much better CV and much better for the company that eventually went and hired her. They could understand much more about her from just reading her blog posts than from her CV. So you have to try and build a trail that you have this kind of interesting knowledge or this interesting opinion. Uh, and again, something I'd say to, to, to my students a lot is this idea that most people don't value the knowledge they already have. Uh, they, they always obsess about big data or cybersecurity or something like that instead of thinking about, oh, yeah, my, I remember one guy, a Venezuelan guy, and his family were in the fashion business, and he had all this information about fashion, and he didn't value it at all, and he wanted to work for, like, Cabify. And I was like, why don't you want to work for fashion and stuff? And he was like, didn't value that information at all. So I'm like, no wonder Cabify don't hire you because they see that you have all this other value. So you have to be able to build a trail. Uh, this is an example of someone who did this, someone from Airbnb, a real story, not something I made up. You know, she 
didn't manage to you know, get a yes through the normal channel, so she basically built something and then sent it to Brian Chesky uh, and then said, hey, Brian, look at this, and, and you know, this is a happy ending type story. This is something that worked out, and there she is on her first day with her Airbnb kit, her Mac and her hoodie and her T-shirt and all of those things. So you know, this is what you've got to do. I mean, what I do in my MIM class uh, is that I actually make them make a presentation uh, how to be hired. So, you know, the Imbas a harder, harder bunch of people and sometimes it's hard to get them to do this, but uh, in the MIM, they have that sort of bit more enthusiasm. So I actually get the, who is it you want to work for, make a presentation explaining why they should hire you. So that's sort of the exercise uh, that I do there. And this is a, an email I got from somebody just explaining how, you know, thanking me for, uh, you know, this new approach and, and how they started to understand. And it was amazing to me that not everyone does this. Uh, but this is the way that, that you, you know, you need to apply to jobs by, by having an individual opinion, by showing that you can solve a problem. That's what they want, you know, especially scale-up companies. That's very much uh, what, they're, what they're looking to do. So further information. So I have uh, just about two or three minutes more, and then I'll take the two questions, and then we will, we will shut this thing off here. Hopefully these lovely gentlemen uh, won't, won't throw me out exactly on time. So further info. Well, the first thing I want to say is that the average age of a successful startup founder is 45. A couple of you follow me on Twitter and will know me tweeting about this so much. And, you know, people you know, find this to be a relative, you know, such a revelation and such an encouraging piece of information that I can't resist talking about it all the time. So not only, uh, you know, this idea that, you know, if you haven't set up a trillion dollar company by the time you're 30, that like it's all over for you. It's not athletics where your, your bodily functions decline. In fact, as you get older, uh, your, your brain perhaps isn't as fast, but it makes connections better. And making connections better is the definition of innovation. Innovation is connecting the unconnected. So what you have uh, in reality is you have a situation where, okay, perhaps you're not very good at like instantly, you know, doing numbers in your head or something like that, but you are better at remembering that guy I met who worked with that guy, you know, why don't we put that product over there with those people? And, you know, most of the innovations are, are not something that's created in a lab. It's finding, you know, ways to combine things that already exist in new and interesting ways. So again, uh, what's my recommendation to people? You know, go to business school, um, get an education, join a scale up, get into something in the beginning of it when it's growing, learn in a kind of a deep tech sort of way uh, what you're doing, and then when you're 45, start a company. Uh, you know, it's as simple as that. And it's, you know, it's again, not many people know this. I certainly didn't know this. Uh, you know, I've started six companies and I'm like 46 now. So I'm, I mean, really, I'm, I should be only starting now. And it's a tremendously kind of, uh, you know, tremendously inspiring way to think about this stuff. Um, a couple of books that are worth reading uh, before I take the questions. So uh, this is Tim Hartford, Adapt. A range is, is the, probably the book I would read first. Uh, because it talks about this idea that, you know, sometimes if it all happens too quickly for you and you get a setback, you never recover. And that it's the only time worth winning is worth winning in the long term. So people who make short-term decisions to specialize too early in their career very often are, are dis... That becomes unfortunate later on in their career. So he talks about this idea that it's more important to have a variety of different skills throughout your career and that they can come together beautifully and wonderful later in life. So, you know, it's a, again a powerful thing because I've had a very kind of a varied career and, and maybe some of it is all coming together now. So Range is a really good book, uh, as is Adapt, which is, you know, it's the ability not, not you know, the, I guess the Darwin thing that survival of the fittest, it's the ability to adapt that makes you progress as a species. And then Daniel Pink, who, you know, talks about motivating and, and, uh, and different kind of things, is really interesting about what motivates people. And, you know, a lot of people are very capable of doing stuff, but, you know, what, what's the thing that makes them actually, uh, you know, take, make the initiative is absolutely fascinating to me. And it's this thing called the trigger effect, whereby what makes somebody move from action. And I've met an awful lot of people who absolutely have the ability to build companies with like $10 million in sales. But, you know, whatever, something never happened. Plus, I've also had people who unfortunate things happened to them in their life, and that forced them then to do great things. And they often say, you know, it's sad that this thing happened, whether my marriage broke up or, or, or something like that, but it turned out 
So I want to see more people taking the initiative without having something bad happen to them. Uh, some other books, um, some other uh, books just quickly. Clayton Christensen, How to Measure Your Life. This idea that uh, you know, sometimes you ask, you get everything you want and you're still not happy. Obviously, Scotty Galloway's book is great in terms of uh, it talks about, uh, you know, it's a series of essays really rather than anything, but talks about, you know, this idea that getting on a good trend. And then finally, this idea of knowing who you are. I always say that it's important to know who you are and get better at that. Ro focus on your strengths and getting even better at your strengths uh, rather than obsessing about your weaknesses. So whether it's sales or whether it's being an introvert or whether it's this idea of deep work. Uh, those are all interesting. So in summary then, uh, scale-ups uh, are not startups and they're not corporates. They're something in the middle. They're great places to work for becoming educated before you start your company. Uh, knowledge is less about discovering new things, uh, more about valuing what you already know. And education is less about the opinions and about uh, your, is less about the opinions of others and more about your own opinion. It's not content that it has an opinion. And finally, finding a job is less about being the same and more about being different. And if you get anything else, if you turn up at an interview that says, I will just do whatever you tell me, good companies uh, don't want those kind of people anymore. So thank you very much uh, for your uh, attention, both uh, now and in the future on YouTube. Uh, this is where you will find me in the various channels and stuff like that. And I'm happy to connect with, with, uh, with everyone. OK, uh, do I have time for questions? Uh, I have one time quickly for questions. Uh, right, Donal, uh, well, let me just take Ignacio's question finally. What would be your key advice uh, to help to to prepare from startup to scale up. Very, okay, this is literally the question I ask every day. Experiment, and maybe, ooh, if I turn around, people might even be able to see me. So uh, find Ignacio, oh, there's Crystal, and Donald, oh, look, and Daniel, and all sorts of people, wow. Uh, so anyway, the question for Ignacio is, what would be your key advice to prepare for a scale up? Okay, so experiment, experiment, experiment. When you find something that works, the big thing is stop doing what's not working and double down on the thing that, that is working. And that's the biggest mistake that people make. And literally, I, people have told me just that sentence was worth like $10,000 the, you know, the $10, to them because that's what people do. It's not a question of what they do. It's what they, don't, what they fail to stop doing. Uh, and that's the thing. I see too many people who try to put whatever fuel they have under four rockets rather than having it under one rocket. So that's kind of the mistake that, that you need to make. Uh, and then finally, Donald's question. Uh, so, oh, Donald, long question, blah, blah, blah. Goal is to have uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, food delivery. More of a comment than a question, Joe. Oh, Donald, is, <laughs> he's going to speak to me. <laughs> I can't read all that information. Nobody, yeah, reads, any, nobody reads anymore. Uh, the one before mine is an actual question. Okay, so where is the actual question? Goal is to have right or right? Very complex problem. Well, listen, Donald, you know, complex problem is a sort of, uh, is, is, uh, is um, anyway, I think I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll agree with you rather than answer anything you've said. Okay, so uh, I think on that basis that uh, we're out of time. So I'll just turn around and wave to everybody and all of that uh, and wave into this camera as well. Thank you very much uh, for your attention uh, and I hope that was useful. And uh, go to CB Insights, find out what your passion is and contact those companies. So thank you very much. Goodbye to everyone. Bye.